uh, having a virtual symposium also enables us to invite fantastic people from all over the world to come and speak and to learn about their research. And joining us from Toronto, Canada today is our first plenary speaker, Dr. Emily Darling. Emily is a coral reef ecologist and conservation scientist with the Wildlife Conservation Society. And here she leads the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Program to investigate how tropical coral reefs are changing. Emily has a diverse research portfolio that covers climate refuges and resilience, coral traits and life histories and coral reef fisheries. Emily is the recipient of the Young Scientist Award from the International Society for Coral Studies, Coral Reef Studies, the Early Career Award from the Canadian Society for Ecology and Evolution, and she was previously an NSERT Banting Postdoc Fellow at the University of Toronto and a David H. Smith Conservation Research Fellow at the University of North Carolina. Emily is a long-term collaborator with many of our current and former staff and students here at the centre, as well as partners throughout the Indo-Pacific, Caribbean and Western Indian Ocean. We're really, really lucky to have her talk with us today. I've been very much looking forward to you um, and to hearing what you have to say, Emily. Um, just in regards to housekeeping, I'll ring a bell um, after 15 minutes. And you can have some more time then and then we'll take some Q&As that I'll moderate. So thank you very much, Emily, and take it away. Um, thank you so much for that warm welcome. Um, as you said, the center has been really important to me um, over, over the years. I've really enjoyed my time uh, with many different collaborators and friends and colleagues. It's really influenced my science. Um, and I am so glad to join you without a 20 hour plane ride and a very large carbon footprint to get there. Um, one thing I didn't expect about virtual talks is that I just pulled my new puppy out of a raccoon carcass <laughs> earlier, just a few minutes ago. And so luckily you can't smell me right now. So other little bonus. Anyways, moving on. Um, so today I, I feel very honored um, to be asked to speak and I, I really wanted to, to pull together a few thoughts that I had about what is coral reef conservation after COVID in particular. I think it's going to have a a very large impact on our, our work, um, both in terms of our professional lives and opportunities. Um, and while it's hard to be a student and an early career researcher these days, um, we're all seeing a lot less jobs and opportunities on the market. I still think there's some really strategic things we can think about um, to have impact in our conservation and our professional uh, careers. So I wanted to tie together a few ideas about that and take you on a little tour um, of some work I've done um, to get to this point. Um, so as you might expect, it can feel really small to be a coral reef scientist these days. Small in both the magnitude of the challenge in tackling, tackling seemingly insurmountable threats like climate change and, and now a global pandemic. Um, but I remember being underwater, and I'm, as I'm sure you all do as well, and feeling small at the majesty of these ecosystems. And I think as the last, over the last five years as a conservation scientist, those two things are always hand in hand, that beauty and bleakness. Um, and with COVID, this balance can feel even more fragile. And I wanted to just, um, you know, take a reality check, take the pulse of what is happening uh, with COVID on some of our coastal communities as we kind of set the stage for where our coral reefs today right now. These are some words from our WCS conservation scientists and teams around the world. Um, in Kenya, Carol Abunge recognizes that there are no longer markets for fishers to sell their fish. There's more fishing for food in communities and there's increasing conflict. In Kenya, uh, closer to, to where many of you are in Australia, um, Sangeeta Mangubai notes that people have lost their jobs. They're going back to home villages and working in more subsistence farming and fishing to feed themselves. And in Madagascar, tourism has collapsed. Prices for fish, octopus, calamari, and seafood have plummeted to less than half of what coastal communities expect to earn um, from coastal and coral reef fisheries. Um, and there's a great paper by Nathan Bennett and colleagues, uh, if you want to read more about these impacts on coastal fisheries. By fisheries um, but I think we all can see that in our lives and, and think more broadly around the world that there is more conflict, livelihoods are vanishing, um, and this changing rural and urban dynamic um, is, is really going to affect coral reef conservation going forward. And of course, this is one pandemic. Um, we know that there is still everything else going on in the Anthropocene, um, from more plastic to back to back to back bleaching events um, to challenges in governance at various different scales. Um, and, and, you know, I think none of us uh, doubt, uh, you know, there, we are in the Anthropocene, corals and, and coral reefs are in the Anthropocene. 
Um, and so our science and our approaches to conservation and management must also adapt. And of course, it's scary and it feels like we're running out of time. Um, we've all seen these statistics um, and they, you know, set the stage for many of our introductions and many of the reasons that we come to work every day to be a coral reef scientist. Um, and it's, it's interesting reflecting back to when I was a student because these were the same messages. Um, you know, we have our science is always within this backdrop of, of urgency. Um, and so thinking back to when I was a graduate student, I wanted to take you a little bit from then to now um, and, and maybe show you some of the twists and turns um, of my work along the way. Um, so this was me um, as a first year PhD student. Um, I would end up spending about the next six years with my head underwater, um, as I'm sure many of you have and are doing as well uh, during your dissertations. Um, I was here in coastal Kenya, uh, just north of Mombasa, where I was fortunate to work both with Isabel Cote uh, at Simon Fraser University in Canada, and also with Tim McClanahan and Yawira Mutiga and their team of WCS Wildlife Conservation Society scientists who had um, nearly a 20 year time series of coral communities. And so we wanted to ask what are the impacts of climate change and fishing on coral communities in Kenya. And again, it was set against that backdrop of urgency of 50% loss, many more corals are threatened, and particularly around a context of synergies. So this idea of, well, now that we have climate change and fishing, surely things are going to get worse. Um, and what we found was actually a little more surprising. And we found that it's not a synergy. Um, and in fact, that climate change is the dominant stressor for reef corals, um, not fishing. And it's, it's interesting to reflect on that now that it's like, duh, of course, you know, especially with the, the really sobering reality of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, but, you know, more than 10 years ago, that was, um, you know, thinking of outside the box in some way. And this idea that, you know, there can be dominant stressors, but they don't necessarily interact to create a, a technical synergy. Um, some, by continuing to keep my head in the water and start to uh, learn my coral genera, um, we, you know, our work showed that both fishing and bleaching erode community composition. So both these stressors have an effect on the, the corals themselves out there on the reef. And, and with that stress, you start to see a, a dominance of corals that have more weedy or stress tolerant traits. Um, and the traits that we typically expect to see on the pages of a National Geographic or when we hear, um, you know, uh, Australian scientists speak about the Great Barrier Reef in years gone by, those are the competitively dominant corals, the table corals, the branching and plating corals. Um, and in Kenya, we found that these corals were only in marine protected areas, but they didn't last very long um, because these corals were then disproportionately lost as soon as a bleaching event swept through. And for these reefs, that was in 1998. Um, so we already saw that legacy of bleaching uh, when I first started at, at arriving in Kenya. And I would talk to Tim and he and Nyawira and hear about what the reefs looked like before I even got there. Um, as I'm sure you know, many of you are hearing as well now, maybe about the Great Barrier Reef or other places where you're working. Um, and it's hard to hear that, to know that I would never see those reefs the way that Tim and Yoira had seen them. Um, but we started to look at some of the mechanisms uh, and patterns of, of why that was. Um, and so that was, that made up for it. That was a little exciting in, in different ways. Um, and so these were the reefs that I saw in Kenya. Um, and so the, you know, the main takeaway message was that stress leads to smaller, flatter, and weedier coral communities. Um, just to orient you to where I was in the Western Indian Ocean, I was here in Southern Kenya, um, Mombasa, Kenya. And uh, through my time working with Tim and Nyawira, I was able to see other places of the Western Indian Ocean. One of those places we traveled 1500 kilometers south in the, to the Karimbas Archipelago of Mozambique. Um, this is where Tessa Hempson is now based in Bumizi, for those of you who uh, may know her as a former student of the center. Um, and this picture is, is different, you know, quite fundamentally different um, in terms of um, diversity, of, uh, of species richness, of likely of function, certainly of function as well. Um, and so, you know, this just blew my mind as a, uh, as this, that traveling further south, I could see such different reefs and the reefs I more likely started to expect. And when we started to think about the mechanisms of why this was, it turns out that this area of Northern Mozambique was in the shadow of the 98 1998 
bleaching event. So this warm water pooled in the Indian Ocean, it hit and spun off the tip of Madagascar, it went straight to Kenya, and it missed these reefs. And so that really got um, me thinking about not only, you know, the role of, of corals, but also what, what these different reefs supported in terms of fisheries, in terms of um, people's livelihoods, and what fish you were seeing in the market. Um, and, you know, is this a climate refuge? And really starting to think about um, how climate refuges can play an important role in conservation. Um, and that shaped a lot of my work going forward. And of course, I just wanted to recognize some crucial work by, uh, by Tim, by Joseph Mina, uh, Loic Pellissier, um, that really set the stage for thinking about climate refuges. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the work by, by Louis Pellissier and David Mouillot and Dave Bellwood was really interesting because it says that several million years ago, habitats that escaped rising temperatures set the blueprint for today's coral reefs. And so could these reefs that we see that are still functioning set the blueprint for coral reefs into the future? Um, and so I really wanted to ask those questions, not just in Kenya and, and, and Mozambique, but around the world. Um, and so I reached out through, um, through conferences, through networks, through workshops, through visiting the center, and asked people to, if they would want to join me in a collaboration and share their data. Um, met so many people said yes, I was blown away. This led to the Indo-Pacific Coral Collaboration, our informal working group, um, where we had information on more than 2,500 sites from 44 countries surveyed uh, from 2010 to 2016 before the 2016 bleaching event um, and just a really remarkable contribution of collaboration from coral reef scientists. Um, this let us tackle those ideas of traits and life histories for the first time at large scales. Um, so these are some image, these are um, some some plots of what the biogeography of different coral life histories looks like across the Indo-Pacific. I just wanted to highlight that you know very differently from where I was in Mombasa, Kenya, 86% of the reefs in this data set had uh, dominance by competitive or stress not tolerant corals, which we typically think of as the framework builders of a reef. So that's still good news. Um, we started modeling what uh, were the drivers of different uh, reefs and life histories, and I'll quick, very quickly take you through that. Um, we, of course, wanted to look at climate drivers, and we first uh, used degree heating weeks to think about thermal stress, and we found that there was more abundance, you had more competitive and stress tolerant corals, these important framework corals, when you had longer recovery intervals and weaker past thermal disturbances. So this is obviously not a surprise to all of the work coming out of the Great Barrier Reef and this, you know, uh, overwhelming impact of climate change. Here we show that that is consistent at much larger regions. And in fact, climate change is the most consistent um, effect on coral abundance compared to any of the other drivers we looked at. We also looked at social drivers. Um, and of course, this was after controlling um, for environment and methodology, which I won't have time to touch on now. Um, but we found that near human populations, closer to fisheries with a higher gravity and stronger agricultural impacts, um, these reduced those framework corals. And instead, we start to see a bump in weedy corals. So really showing that different coral traits respond differently um, to, to local pressures, um, as well as, as climate pressures at a global impact. I wanted to highlight that there is no, we found no significant effect of no-take closures on corals. Um, again, this is not as surprising to us now because we know that um, no-take closures are predominantly uh, there to impact fish. Um, many of them are small and young and perhaps ineffective, um, but we can't just put an MPA on a reef and expect that to lead to climate resilience. We have to be more strategic. One of the ways we started to think about that um, was actually looking across thresholds. So using our data set, um, combining with um, existing thresholds in the literature um, to try to be more strategic, to, to stay away from just um, the, the, you know, the, the popular idea of just put an MP on it, it will be fine, and actually start to tackle ecological function and climate impact. So we did that through these two axes. Um, one is the you're gonna is the summed cover of those competitive and stress tolerant corals. These are the big, large framework building corals on a reef. Um, and the other is the maximum degree heating weeks that those reefs were exposed to in the most recent uh, bleaching series of bleaching events. And so when we look at um, where different reefs might land in this framework, that can tell us something about 
what their future trajectories with conservation might look like. For example, um, reefs that have um, uh, enough coral cover, particularly of those framework corals where we know they're actively accreting carbonate and building a reef, um, and they escaped uh, the worst, you know, uh, heat impacts of the recent bleaching event, that might be a good place to look for refuges and ultimately protect them, thinking about um, managing and conserving uh, ecological function in the face of whatever local pressures might exist there. In places where you still have functioning reefs, um, but perhaps were impacted by the most recent bleaching event, here's a place uh, where you might want to recover functioning corals. So you had conditions for functioning, they likely got smoked by a recent bleaching event. They may be uh, trending or falling below key thresholds. How can we recover and rebuild them? And then of course, there's the sobering reality of what about everywhere else? What about the reefs that um, are, you know, are fallen below a 10% coral cover threshold? They're likely eroding and losing their carbonate. Um, what do we do there? And really they're potentially across a whole spectrum. It might not matter what the climate change impact is there. You might want to start working closely with uh, social scientists, with public health, with development experts, and thinking about how do we transform societies away from a dependence on reefs, um, or you know how do we transform management or transform those reefs because they're in a, a real danger zone. We put our data set into this framework, which is more theoretical. We added empirical data, and we found that all 2,500 uh, reefs, you know, fit into fit into this framework. You know, we expected that, but that they fit across all three strategies. So there was some protect, the majority were recover, but there were also transform sites. And so when we looked at this on a map, what I thought was interesting is that there are uh, these strategies are located across the region. So there's not one region that's hit or miss, or we're going to lose. These same trajectories can be on nearest neighbor reefs. So these are our two recover and transform strategies here, and here are the refuges, um, potential refuges, again, across the world. And to me, this is really hopeful. It says that, um, you know, there are still functioning reefs that have escaped the most recent bleaching events, um, that we can understand their function, um, and that we can work together to protect. Um, this is the part of the talk where I usually ask, how long did people think it took us to put together that data set and come to those conclusions? Um, and it's harder, unfortunately, to look out at the audience now, um, but I will, I will give away the ghost, um, and it was six years from the time of collecting my first data set to that paper coming out, and that's too long. And so uh, we, myself and, and colleagues wanted that to, well, I in particular want to never do that again in terms of cleaning other people's data for six years, even though that's still sort of my job, but never mind. Um, and so we developed um, the first open source data platform for coral reef uh, underwater transects. It's called Mermaid. Um, I unfortunately, I'm not gonna have time to, to show you uh, too much about it, other than to say um, people are using it around the world. Uh, we currently have standardized surveys from 10 countries, over 10,000 transects, 1,200 sites. Um, and by using standardized web forms, you're able to navigate in, look at your data, look at other collaborations in the region, and then tackle this question, um, is there still healthy coral cover here? And what are we going to do about it? And you can see from this histogram in the bottom that there are still very healthy reefs out there um, that are work that are crucial to to coral reef function and resilience. Um, and and this is a good this is a good sign um, to learn more about data and uh, you know contribute you want to contribute some of your surveys to um, add your data. We have some new easy to use Excel templates um, and it's a real privilege to be working with Ian Caldwell and Josh Sinner on thinking about some of their surf data, um, also uh, working with Mermaid. So moving on, why do these types of large scale uh, surveys matter? Well, we have to find resilience. I think regardless of the doom and gloom statistics, we can't give up there and we have to think about, well, what are we going to do? You know, the more we think about resilience as being two pieces, both resistance and recovery, um, work by Terry and others through synthesis has obviously shown that recovery windows are closing and there is not enough time uh, between bleaching events, as of course you've seen on the Great Barrier Reef. So if instead we focus on resistance, um, you know, uh, and I, you know, feel free to track down this paper, or I'm, I'm happy to chat about it um, in some of the questions, we think that there's a couple ways that we can enhance resistance. Um, it can either be through species traits, 
Um, it can be through uh, those types of environmental refugia, whether that's greater depth or cooler currents or some other under things we don't understand yet. Um, and then, of course, we have to connect all of these things, these different pieces of resistance to get that conservation at scale. Um, I'm going to move ahead quickly because I don't want to run out of time. Of course, this is so crucial for people. Um, it's been such a privilege to work um, to build on some of Josh's work and work really closely with Georgina, who I'm sure gave a wonderful plenary yesterday. I can't wait to watch it um, on recording. It was the middle of my night. Um, but on how do we scale up uh, social and ecological systems monitoring. Um, and we're doing that across WCS sites. We're also doing that in partnerships, both with practitioners and policymakers and scientists. Um, and I think that's really that transdisciplinary approach is really going to be the way we're going to leverage our science into policy impact. So in summary, um, species and traits matter for how coral reefs are, so will survive and persist into the future. And I would encourage you uh, in your studies to embrace mechanisms. Um, don't don't, try, don't take for granted um, the, the things that we tell you as we've seen right now. Things are changing. Understand how the mechanisms of the places you work uh, work now and will work into the future. Future. I think that mechanistic approach is something I really uh, valued when I was a grad student. Climate change and other human pressures are compounding and they will create surprises. I would encourage you to be willing to learn. Um, we are not playing in a stable playing field. It is not a stable world as we all know. Um, keep willing to learn. Keep that thirst for learning that I'm sure you all have now during your, your graduate work. Test your ideas in new contexts. Um, if I had just stopped where I was in Mombasa, I, I never would have understood what, uh, what coral reefs were doing in other parts of the world. Take your ideas, take them to new places. It's okay to be wrong. Uh, when it's, when you know, you're not wrong, you're, you're learning about different contexts. And so I really uh, encourage you to, to, to go out and try to fail, try to be wrong, and think about what you're learning uh, when things don't go the way you expect. Um, and I'd also encourage you to think interdisciplinary and think transdisciplinary. Involve practitioners and policymakers in designing your very first idea. Maybe not for your whole thesis, but maybe for one chapter. Um, and, and I think stepping outside, I mean, we're all outside our comfort zone in a global pandemic. Um, but even with your science, uh, step outside your comfort zone. I think there's a lot to learn there. Um, I promised a few little last, very last ideas about coral reef science and COVID. I would encourage you to connect with new collaborations during this great pause. What data sets have you already collected and how can you bring those together with other data sets, other people or other sectors? Many of us are not going to be able to travel internationally for a long time. It's not just the reefs in, uh, in the US or Australia that we need to learn about. It's in a hundred different countries. Um, those countries uh, have scientists who are working there either as NGOs or government, and you can choose the impact you want to have by working with them. Um, so I think I'd really encourage you to reach out to NGOs. We're in countries, we're ready to hit the ground running. Many of our countries are already out of lockdown. And you know, this time can really be a chance to, to get to know different researchers around the world um, and, and, and choose the impact uh, you want to have in your career. Um, and lastly, and so importantly, this can also be a time to catalyze change, both in our science and our approaches. We must actively decolonize our science. We must be actively anti-racist in our institutions and networks. I know I've found it personally really hard to, to do science lately, um, but I've found a lot more inspiration from actively reading a lot about how do we decolonize uh, field science, how do we decolonize conservation, and how within uh, every day of work I'm doing, how do we be anti-racist and make sure that the diversity of opinions and people we so value um, are, are recognized in our leadership and, and in our, our science and our ideas. Um, thank you so much. Um, this work would not have been possible uh, without so many people. Um, a number of you will recognize some center alumni I particularly like to highlight uh, Christina Hicks, Nick Graham, Josh Sinner, Amelia Wenger, Georgina Gurney. Um, and I hope I haven't missed anyone. I'll feel horrible. Um, but the center has been so important to me. Um, thank you for everyone who contributed data. And uh, that's it for me and funded the work. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>